So if people could come in and take their seats. I don't want to shortchange the next speaker. So the next speaker is Jonathan Lynch. Uh, he's from uh, Penn State University. And he's going to take some of those diminishing dollars that are being invested in agricultural research. Uh, and he's going to take a look at some of the challenges that we're going to be faced uh, with climate change and use some of the diversity. Well, I, I'm guessing. I'm just interpreting. Uh, that he's going to use some of that diversity that that Kerry is so passionate about keeping uh, track of. So, Jonathan, we're looking forward to this. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Peggy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, we'll be talking about some of the things that the previous two speakers have, have brought up. Actually, the title of my presentation, Roots of the Second Green Revolution. The first green revolution was the development of dwarf varieties of wheat and rice that could respond to fertilizer without lodging. It was a, it was a genetic technology to respond to high inputs, one of the most significant agricultural advances of the last century. I'll be talking about the second green revolution, which is what I believe we need now, which is the making plants that can grow well at low input levels. Do we need such a green revolution? The previous speakers have mentioned some of these issues. We currently have about 800 million chronically hungry people. That number is expanding in the poorest countries. Over half of all childhood deaths in, the, in poor countries are related to malnutrition. And of course, the human population is still expanding. Virtually all of that expansion is expected to occur in food insecure regions. In these regions, Low input agriculture is uh, the most important human activity. In fact, it's the single largest human occupation on Earth. And in these low input systems, productivity is severely limited by water and nutrients. They're actually low output systems. Here's some data from maize, rice, and common bean. Yield obtained in different parts of the Earth, the top bar being yield potential under ideal conditions you can see that maize is losing 95% of its yield potential in sub-Saharan Africa. Rice grown in water is still losing 80% of its yield in Africa. Common bean, which can fix nitrogen from the air, losing 90% of its potential yield in Africa. Now, plant stress is a major global limitation to agricultural productivity, but in these poor countries, it is a principal pervasive cause of poverty and hunger. Some of the constraints that we're concerned with and I'll be talking about today, phosphorus. This is a map of phosphorus availability for plants on Earth. Any red indicates uh, suboptimal level of phosphorus availability. It is a primary constraint to life on this planet. Nitrogen, this is a, a map of nitrogen balance on a yearly basis. You can see the orange and yellow colors in Africa indicate those systems are in negative nitrogen balance. They're losing nitrogen every year. Drought, of course, is a principal constraint and risk to global agriculture that's expected to get worse in years ahead. The soil base, the soil fertility that's the basis for agriculture is declining because of soil degradation, which is very severe. The UN estimated in 2006, they estimated that the, at least 75% of the cropland in Africa was severely degraded. This is an ongoing process getting worse every year. And input use in these poor nations is negligible and declining. This is the data for fertilizer use uh, on a global basis. You can see this is a log scale. So those orange red colors are basically negligible amounts of fertilizer. Uh, this is getting worse over time because as energy costs rise, fertilizer costs rise, and fertilizer use declines in poor nations. So what we need is plants that can tolerate stressful conditions. I'm going to tell you two stories today. The first one is going to be about this plant. Physiolus vulgaris, Physiolus vulgaris, common bean, the most important food legume on Earth, an important source of nutrients for about one billion people. Um, here's a typical bean production environment in the Andes in South America. 
And you can see on the, on the right a, one of these bean plants growing in a maize bean intercrop. And this plant is severely phosphorus deficient. I expect it to lose 80 to 90 percent of its yield to low phosphorus. And most beans on earth look like this. This is, in fact, the most uh, GIS analysis indicates this is the most pervasive constraint to bean production on earth is low phosphorus. I actually began looking at this problem in 1987. I finished my PhD, went to work at the International Center for Col or, uh, Tropical Agriculture in Columbia, South America, one of the CG systems we've heard about earlier today. And there they had just uh, terminated their breeding program to find phosphorus-efficient beans after 20 years with several seasons per year of brute force screening, putting out hundreds of bean lines in, the fee in a low phosphorus field and seeing which ones yielded best. They had failed to find anything that would beat their best line, which is a Brazilian land race called Carioca. I wasn't satisfied with this result. I thought we could do a better job if instead of looking at yield, which is affected by many, many things, we looked at specific traits that confer adaptation to low phosphorus and then combine those in an intelligent breeding program. So to make a long story short, we were able to identify a number of traits that conferred superior growth and yield in low phosphorus soils. There were root architectural traits. Phosphorus is immobile in soil, and so it's concentrated in the topsoil. So bean plants that have good top, root traits that give them good topsoil foraging do better in these low phosphorus soils. There's a number of these traits. I won't go through all of them today. I'll just give you an example, some examples of some of the traits that are important. This is one of the first one we observed. You can see we're looking at the main root class in bean are called uh, basal roots. And you can see there's quite a difference in the growth angle of these basal roots from very deep to very shallow. This is natural genetic variation. And this is, I think, why Peggy asked me to talk today. Our work is based upon natural phenotypic variation. In the field in Honduras, you can see the shallow rooted plant is going to do much better in a, a topsoil foraging for phosphorus resources. In fact, if we combine a deep and shallow rooted line and generate recombinant inbred lines from that, those parents, and so we have the same genetic background, you can see in this case variation in topsoil foraging is related to 600% variation in phosphorus uptake in the field. Uh, genetic analysis. This is a kind of a course map that was done about 10 years ago, a QTL map, uh, the 11 bean chromosomes. You can see that loci controlling yield in low phosphorus fields in the tropics, those are the red loci there, are co-segregating with uh, genetic regions that are associated with root shallowness we measure in, in the lab. And so this indicates when breeders select for shallow rooted bean plants, they'll get better yield in low phosphorus fields. Here's another trait. Now here we're looking at root hairs. We're looking under a microscope. These are subcellular protrusions from the root epidermis. On the left, you see the result of scientific breeding. Uh, on the right, you see a land race that has nice long and dense root hairs. And, and this is something we have always unfailingly observed, which is that land races have much better root traits than scientifically bred lines. So this is a trait that should help with soil exploration and phosphorus acquisition. Once again, we crossed these two lines, made a set of progeny with the same genetic background that varied for this trait. You can see here the performance in the field in the background. Very nice relationship of root hair length in the field and phosphorus acquisition. In this case, a 250% increase in phosphorus acquisition associated with, with variation for this trait. This is a relatively simple trait. Six loci control over half the variation. So, you know, breeders are interested in combining traits to make an excellent genotype, and so we're interested in how these fiends combine, how these traits combine. So in this case, we have the same population, but now they've, the, the progeny vary for both root hairs and uh, basal root growth angle. So the baseline in this field study in Mozambique had short root hairs and, sh and deep roots, which should be the worst for phosphorus acquisition. Uh, related lines having... Um, shallow basal roots had 60% better growth in this field environment in Africa. Uh, lines that had long root hairs had 90% better growth than the baseline. So we'd expect that lines that had both long root hairs and shallow roots should have 90 plus 60, 150% better growth. In fact, Magoyais observed that these plants had 300% better growth, which stands to reason. Long root hairs are going to be more useful if they're on shallow roots in the topsoil than if they're on deep roots in the subsoil. I bring up this, and I'll come back to this later, um, because when we're thinking about 
combining traits, combining fiends into integrated phenotypes, we have to think about the possibility for substantial interactions among traits, and that's something we have to think about in, in breeding. Another thing we have to think about in breeding is trade-offs. In other words, most traits for which there's natural variation are not always useful, and so we have to think about what trade-offs exist in these traits. In this case, we're looking at shallow versus deep-rooted lines in an environment in Honduras where we had both drought and low soil fertility. The control plants were fertilized in water. They grew the same. Under low phosphorus, the shallow genotypes did significantly better, as we'd expect. But under drought, the deep-rooted genotypes did significantly better, as we would expect. And so this is a real conundrum for breeders. Breeders don't want to produce a line that has good roots for phosphorus acquisition, but are more drought sensitive. So you know, how do we kind of co-optimize acquisition of a deep and a shallow resource? We were pleased to discover a trait that seems to help us with uh, this. This is, we noticed that um, basal roots occur from distinct positions. We're calling whorls in this species. And the number of whorls varies genetically. Here we have a genotype with one whorl versus one with three whorls. And the number of whorls is directly related to the number of basal roots. Each position can produce four basal roots. And the hope was, the idea was, but by having more basal roots, and each whorl has a kind of characteristic growth angle, we'd have a greater range of soil exploration. So genotypes with more whorls could actually acquire both water and phosphorus. This was the hope. Um, these are what the, the phenotypes look like as we go from one to four whorls. Having those more axial roots actually reduces the growth of lateral roots and slows down the, the elongation rate of the roots. But we do have that broader range of uh, vertical range of soil exploration. So once again, this is work of Magalhães Miguel uh, working in the field in Africa, showing that if we compare with the same genetic background, genotypes with two whorls or three whorls, we have 60% greater growth at low P by having more whorls. Uh, Katie Barlow, working at our site in South Africa, looked at a study like this under drought conditions. In this case, she had a population with one, two, or three whorls, all with the same genetic background, and she found no effect of this trait on uh, growth under well water conditions under drought, a 70% greater growth of these plants under drought by having more whorls. So this, this trait is very promising as a way for us to get both shallow and deep soil exploration. It's a very interesting trait, controlled by two dominant uh, QTL, very easy to phenotype, and so this is a very promising trait for, for breeders in, in uh, low input environments. Another thing we have to think about in breeding for low input environments is ecosystem impacts. These people are not using fertilizers. So if we have plants that acquire more phosphorus over time, we could degrade soil fertility over time, something we don't want to do. Now, I didn't think, th this was a good question. It really hadn't been researched. We didn't think this was going to be a problem because beans are often grown in sloping upland sites. And you can see here on the left, we have like a conventional modern bean production site in a developing country, assuming we have one metric ton of yield, which is twice the world average. Those yellow numbers are kilograms of phosphorus per hectare per year. So in one ton of bean seed, we'll have two kilograms of phosphorus removed in the seed. Now, if we double yield to two tons, we'll remove four kilograms of phosphorus per hectare. So yes, indeed, we're mining the soil. However, the largest number in this diagram is erosion. You can see on the left, we're estimating a conventional bean field might be losing up to 100 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare per year in the form of erosion. On the right, if we have a bigger plant, we'll have less erosion. And so by reducing erosion, we could more than counteract the effect of, of removal of phosphorus in the seed. That was the hope. That was the idea. This is uh, part of the PhD research of Amelia Henry. And you can see she's basically went out into the countryside in Costa Rica, rented bean fields from bean farmers. You can see how steep they are. She installed lysimeters and shows she's able to catch over a two-year cycle the phosphorus leaving the field, measure the phosphorus leaving the field in the form of seed. You can see comparing the deep-rooted and the shallow-rooted lines. The shallow-rooted bean lines are actually bigger. They cover the soil better. And, you can, and she found that uh, she was the, the shallow-rooted lines actually reduced phosphorus runoff by 50 to 70 percent. So it seems like this technology of extracting more phosphorus from the soil actually improves soil fertility over time, in addition to benefits of a greater nitrogen fixation and, of course, more food and more income for the farm family. 
So where's, uh, where we are with, with SEAT now, Carioca, which was the unbeatable bean line that, that uh, cost a soil scientist his job, and they closed the program down in 1987. It is now uh, a bad, it used as the bad check that the breeders compare their new lines against. We have the SEAT lines now that are, have these good root traits that are much better than Carioca. This is some data from Steve Beebe, the leader of the bean program at SEAT. You can see this is a, a trial in Colombia with and without phosphorus. Carioca without phosphorus is yielding about 500 kilos per hectare, with phosphorus about two and a half tons. We have three of these new lines, which the good root traits. Look at G19A33, for example. Same yield as Carioca with fertilizer. Without fertilizer, three times better yield. We tripled the yield of Carioca. The other two lines double the yield of Carioca with no fertilizer. That's just because of the selection for root traits. So these lines and others with good root traits are being used as parents in the uh, breeding programs at SEAT and therefore distributed throughout Africa and Latin America. This is not trait-based selection. This is just taking our phenotypic information and throwing them into their recurrent selection program as parents. We have a number of sponsors who are interested in taking a more focused approach to this in Africa, however. Uh, the McKnight Foundation Generation Challenge Program, the Buffett Foundation, USAID are trying to help us uh, push this technology forward in Africa, working with uh, colleagues, especially in Mozambique. And you can see here in the top left panel, the woman in the left part of the photo is, is Celestina Swar uh, Shalsina Joshua. Um, she's the bean breeder for the government of Mozambique, uh, did her PhD with me. So she's using root hairs and basal root whorl number to select phenotypically select bean lines with these good root traits. After several years of selection, just this last year, she, she did field studies showing that these new lines have two to three times better yield in the field than the best materials we had before. The person on the right of that photo is her husband. That's Suarez Sarinda. He's an agronomist. Suarez is showing that these new lines have much better nitrogen fixation, that they have less soil erosion than previous lines, that they don't bother the maize that they're grown with in intercrops, and that they're better able to utilize locally available rock phosphorus resources. So this seems like a great story. We've doubled, we've tripled yield, we have ecological benefits. Uh, everybody should be happy, but it's not that simple. Our sponsors are not interested in any of that stuff. Our sponsors are interested in how do these new lines benefit people. So we've been working with Jill Findice at the University of Missouri, social scientist, to determine how these new lines are going to affect communities and households. So uh, Jill's work has shown the importance of human factors. It done several years of massive uh, sets of interviews and a kind of a before the technology is ready, we're kind of assessing what's likely to happen, a pre-hoc analysis. And uh, uh, through many, many interviews, Jill found that um, if you ask women what would happen if we Im improve this type of bean, this is actually a karaoke type. Uh, this type has no commercial value. Because it has no commercial value, the husbands have nothing to do with it. The women just grow this and feed their children. The women would be very happy to have a more yield of this seed because they would feed their children. 70% of the families in Mozambique are food insecure, so this would be a very nice impact. However, if we improve this, this type of, the second type of bean, this is a sugar type, she's a little less uh, optimistic because any yield will go, any extra yield will be taken by the husband, sold in the local markets. And if you interview men, and Jill does these interviews very carefully, you interview men with male interviewers when the women are not around and you, to get the straight story. And, and um, this, is, this particular picture I'm showing you is not the guy in question. There's hundreds and hundreds of interviews. And what men will do with more money is buy beer. And it, we're not the only project to have found this out in Africa. Um, now, this is not entirely a loss for the family because the family does not own their own land. And so uh, by, having, by drinking beer with the village headman, the family might receive a better allocation of land and there might be some benefit to the family. Um, that was the story we got from the men anyway. But then if we improve the type of this red bean, now I have seen this bean selling in Mozambique for $1.90 US a pound. Uh, average wage in, in uh, this part of the world is 70 cents a day. It's a very high value crop. If these people have access to an urban market where they can uh, command these prices, it's a very valuable commodity. The woman's very concerned. If we improve the yield of this type because the man will make so much money, he's gonna get a new wife. 
This is a polygamous culture. The more money you have, the more wives you have. So she's trying to optimize her reproductive output, thinking as a biologist, by feeding her children, and he's optimizing his reproductive output by having more children. So this kind of complicates our impact with our donors saying, you know, are we improving beer production and, and polygamy, or are we feeding hungry children?